we're all wired differently. We're all, you know, like some of us are auditory, some of us are visual, some of us, you know, are sensory. And, um, you know, we have different kinds of traumas, right? We have different kinds of history. And so, you know, the one size fits all model has already proven to just not work in medicine. And I think we've learned um, over the last, you know, several couple decades in particular that, you know, the psychological resilience protective factors and all these things that, you know, can be added to a human um, to help them through this are just a part of it, but there's many ways to climb the mountain and you got to find your own. Hello and welcome to Real Men Feel. I am author, coach, and healer, Andy Grant. Thank you for joining us today as we are going to explore trauma. If you are feeling the draw to release and heal traumas that you've been carrying for far too long, I invite you to schedule a complimentary clarity call with me. Go to theandygrant.com slash talk while I still have a couple open slots for one-on-one -on -one work. Again, go to the, as in T-H-E, andygrantme.com slash talk because you matter. My guest today is New York Times bestselling author, speaker, filmmaker, and co-founder of Whole TV, Pedram Shojai. Pedram is a former Taoist monk, an accomplished doctor of Chinese medicine and green activist who has lectured on wellness around the world. I discovered him thanks to his epic 10-part documentary on trauma. Pedram shares the biological history of men shutting down their emotions and leads us into a deep dive exploring trauma, resiliency, and denial. You'll hear great tips for what a guy who rolls his eyes at the notion of self-love can do for himself and hear what Pedram hopes could be humanity's quantum leap. Let's do it. Hello, Pedram. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Real Men Feel. Great to be here. I'm really excited for this. Um, and I'm just jump, jump right into this. What made you decide to do such an in-depth documentary on trauma? <laughs> it's like the elephant in the room. And, you know, it, it, over the years, it just became more and more clear to me how much trauma was kind of the fabric um, uh, on which the tapestry on which all of our kind of life's events were, were happening. And, you know, it's, no one wants to talk about it. It's kind of this underlying thing. Right. But even in like, you know, kind of some of the most, uh, you know, simple clinical experiences, it's like, hey, we just here's your MRI. Here's your blood work. We figured out what's wrong with you. Here's what you you know, here's what you do to fix it. And then self-sabotage and then they don't do it. And then, you know, no, no follow through. It's like, yo, what? And then, you know, nine times out of 10, there was some underlying trauma. It's like, you know what? They don't actually want to heal because that would mean having more energy and their signal coming up which means then they got to feel more, right? And so we live in a culture that anesthetizes because we move away from pain. Mm. And, you know, it just became abundantly clear to me that trauma was something that just needed the spotlight. There are so many definitions of trauma. Do, do you have a, a favorite one or one that you're most easily shareable? I mean, look, any event that had a psycho-emotional spiritual imprint that, um, you know, stayed with you, um, having some sort of reaction or aversion to something that was too, much, too high in magnitude for you to deal with at the time. So you, you know, you brush it under the rug and you, you know, you come back one day when you're taller, smarter, wealthier, stronger to deal with it. But, you know, look, you roll into the future and the punches keep coming. So it's really hard to go backward. It really is. Now, I find that most men, when I was growing up and even now, are, are hesitant to get help, even for the big, obvious phys physical pain, let alone depression, PTSD, more, more the unseen pains. So how can men better appreciate and become aware of all the smaller traumas that are affecting their lives? Well, I mean, just think about the, the tape that's running through your head. Think about the ongoing themes, the, the, the dramas and the challenges you have at work, the problems you have with your wife. I mean, all these things are telltale indicators that there's something underneath that's kind of emanating this signal. Um, but we're just not, you know, we're, to, we're, we're taught to cut and move forward. We're taught to, you know, suppress the feelings 
so that we can push on in life. And, you know, look, that works well in a battlefield. You and I are charging the enemy. I take a bullet, I fall down. You're going to sit there and cry over me. You're going to take the next bullet. You got to fight, right? Um, but then there's a, a, a period of mourning and a period of reconciliation with that that needs to happen. Um, and most men don't get that, right? Most men don't allow themselves to go and, and come full circle and heal. It's just not part of our culture. Um, and it's led to uh, a lot of aberrant psychological issues, hasn't it? Yeah. So is, is one of the core issues that we're really treating life like it's a fight, like it's war. I mean, well, it's, it's kind of what we know. I mean, you know, the, for better or for worse, and, you know, I don't, I don't even know what political correctness is anymore. But, you know, we, we grew up in this hunter-gatherer, forager, um, tribal uh, thing where, you know, um, and, and you go back to some of the anthropological kind of studies on this. It's like, you know, we'd all be traveling together in a pack. And then one week out of the year, the predators uh, would come and attack us. And the, um, the animals knew that we were coming. And, you know, we quickly figured out it was because the females in the tribe were bleeding, right? So it's like, oh, shit, this is a, this is a liability. This is a thing, right? So how about this? For this week, why don't y'all just sit by the river and like have the kids gather nuts and stuff while we go out and hunt um, to keep everyone safe. And, you know, just, just a, a real biological division of labor. And then fast forward, you know, a few thousand years of that happening. It's just like, Hey, how about you guys just stay by the river and keep the noisy kids with you and we'll go, you know, bring back, bring back some meat. And so there were evolutionary bifurcations in the way we started to adapt and, and, and feel like you got time to sit around and talk about emotions and talk things through and, and feel it and emote it. And it's like, you know, you, you have tribe there, you could talk, you could do things and you're on the hunt. You can't even talk. And, you know, guy goes down, um, you got to keep fighting. Right. And so it created a separation. Now, you know, the world's changed and, you know, things are kind of, you know, getting coming back together and changing in ways that are, frankly, unpredictable at this point, but I think that we would be remiss not talking about the kind of evolutionary trajectory of kind of the male-female tribal dynamics that got us here. And now, yeah, I mean, look, do what you want and be who you want and all that. But, you know, there's millions of years of biological tendencies that allowed um, or not allowed, I don't think allowed is even the right word, that, that, that forced men to become more uh, succinct and uh, capable of cutting their emotions. And in doing so, you know, there were, there were tried and true methodologies. You come back, you sit with the shaman, you come back, you mourn, you do all these things to reintegrate. And so we threw the baby out with the bathwater. So we learned how to cut the emotions and we left none of the ritual or any of the things that were designed to capture that state and bring it back, bring us back into wholeness and healing. And now it's all stiff upper lip all day, every day, right? Yeah. It just doesn't work. Yeah. All right. That's, that's something when I think that, I mean, so many men that can we'll say you know the past is the past no use complaining you know soldier on all that sort of stuff and they seem to function well so is that resilience uh, denial or, or or both i mean look uh, it, you know being a being a clinician and a doctor for so long there's always the wife that dragged that dude in when his heart started banging too hard you know the guys guys have you know higher incidence of heart attacks and hypertension and all those types of things because they internalize it right um you know they're they're likely to go towards alcoholic tendencies using some sort of sedatives doing some sort of aberrant behavior you know cheating on their wife whatever it is as a stress relief mechanism that isn't necessarily wholesome because they are you know pretending to be this tank that, you know, has bulletproof armor, right? It's just, it's, it's just a false narrative and it's not fair to our boys. So is the notion, not even the notion, the reality of kind of the unfeeling man, the man that is separated from his emotions, are we victims of, bi of our biology and evolution? Yeah, I mean, listen, I think there's sociology. I think that the biology and the evolutionary pathways that cut off, there's actually chemicals that get secreted, um, I think only for men uh, in, in utero, 
that um, start to trim some of the neuronal connections um, for kind of emotional um, late, uh, latency, if you will. And so the limbic system develops differently. Um, and it was, I mean, it was primal division of labor. And um, I think that we just took the brunt of it um, and got real good at hunting, got real good at fighting wars, right? Like we, we get it done. And, um, you know, we have now evolved into a much more complex world where life just ain't that simple. I wash dishes with my wife every night, you know, like, you know, there's, there's, there's things like, there's no division of labor on the home front. And, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to all kind of, you know, figure out this new normal. And I think it's wonderful. So I don't want to be, you know, I don't, I don't want to be dismissive of the fact that, you know, things have changed and that's cool, but not looking back at how we got here, I think is, is stupid, right? Like we were different. We did it differently. Mostly, you know, most tribes, most cultures did it differently between men and women. It was a division of labor and we kind of evolved, uh, you know, down our own kind of forks. So is, is this same notion of always on the hunt, always on the fight? Is, is that what's behind so many men being resistant to, to ask for help, to say, I'm hurting? Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, look, the show must go on. And if I slow down, then I got to admit a lot of things. <laughs> Right. I got all sorts of stuff that happened. Right. You know, whether it's bullies from the schoolyard, whether it was, you know, losing your job, whether, well, you know, whatever it was, you know, we have buried it for so long that it's just, it's too, it feels like it's insurmountable to even, you know, turn around and address that. So we just move forward. Right. We move away from it. So if our biological drive, our ancestry, everything that brought us up to this day in our life says, just keep going forward, shut it down, don't feel. E examining our wounds will be even more painful, so I'm not going to do that. Is it, is it really at the point that we have to hit that proverbial rock bottom, each individual, uh, in order to, to get help? No, but for most of us, we're numbskulls, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of merit in listening to the wisdom of elder elders. There's a lot of merit in reading books and being like, oh shit, I do that. Maybe I shouldn't, right? Um, but we're numbskulls. Like we're so caught up in our world. We're so caught up in like the guy I need to be for my family and, you know, the breadwinner and all these kind of narratives that keep us bound to uh, a storefront that we have to uphold at any cost. That That just seems like a frivolous pursuit, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, one thing I really liked most of, of your 10 part documentary on trauma was how many options for healing, how many opportunities, how many, how many different paths there were. But I've, I've met lots of people that will, they'll find something that works for them and they'd be, be kind of pissy if everyone else doesn't get the same results or better by doing that same thing. So yeah. it, is there one ideal path for everybody? May, may multiple healing modalities work for everybody? Like what, what, what are your views on that? I mean, look, whatever works for you, that's, that's your thing, right? And we're all different. We're all wired differently. We're all, you know, like some of us are auditory, some of us are visual, some of us, you know, are sensory. And, um, you know, we have different kinds of traumas, right? We have different kinds of history. And so, you know, the one size fits all model has already proven to just not work in medicine. And I think we've learned, um, over the last, you know, several couple decades in particular that, you know, the psychological resilience, protective factors and all these things that, you know, can be added to a human um, to help them through this are just a part of it, but there's many ways to climb the mountain and you got to find your own. Right. And so people who are all just like, you know, tap this and it'll make your history go away. You're like, come on. You know, there's just so much crap out there. Has it always been easy for you? To, to ask for help, receive help. No, I'm a numbskull too, man. I mean, yeah, you know, I grew up with a dad who was just, you know, like, hey, if you're done with your homework, do more homework, right? Or, you know, if that guy wants, to, if that guy comes to bully you, you punch him in the face first. And yeah, you know, it's all this guy, guy wisdom, right? And some of it saved my ass and some of it's great, right? Like I'm not the guy that gets picked on at a party, right? So there's, again, there's things that are helpful, to, you know, survive the, the, the kind of the nasty streets, if you will. And there's things that, you know, develop you into a brute and make you less capable of, of you know, 
feeling things and understanding what you're feeling. And that becomes a real bad downward spiral, which, you know, there are very clear cut, you know, ways of anesthetizing that. I mean, Coors Light is on your TV every day trying to tell you that that's the way out, right? Like there's so many ways to culturally escape without looking like, you know, pardon my expressions. Like if you're soft, you're a faggot or you're gay or, you know, all these weird colloquialisms that come from homophobia and just all sorts of shit. Right. And you're like, well, I don't want to be that. Right. And it's, it's, it's all just nonsense, but you know, it's just kicked down generation or generation. What would it take to, to end that? Or are, are we ended? Do you see it getting better or is it just still shits flowing downhill? No, nah, it's getting better. And it's also, you know, you see, you saw it in the political cycles this last round. I mean, people are kind of digging in their heels and people who have resisted feeling are certainly not interested in feeling at all now. Right. Um, I'm seeing some real serious, significant cracks in the concrete um, with some of the somatic therapies, the psychedelic assisted psychotherapies. Uh, you know, I think the narrative is opening up, but I think the pendulum is swinging real hard. I can't keep up with all the pronouns and I can't keep up with all the fucking Nazis. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, there's a middle. And right now the pendulum is just swinging so hard that it's just, it's hard to relax. Everyone's mad. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you see the pendulum swings as kind of generational or, or might we find balance in our time? <sighs> Question of the hour, ain't it? <laughs> um, it's definitely generational. It definitely goes through these, you know, hundred year cycles or, you know, the turnings, if you will. Um, but, you know, it's on us in every single generation to effectively be part of a quantum leap in the evolution of the species, especially with our backs against the wall now, especially as, you know, water is starting to run low and the climate's starting to, you know, get, get testy on us. Like this rock will kick us off if we don't get our shit together. And, you know, we are now facing, you know, some, some would deny it, but we are now facing an existential dilemma for not just our species, but for multiple species extinctions happening on planet earth. So it's like, yo, you monkeys going to wake up or are you going to continue to blindly, you know, pollute and kill and do the things that you've been doing? And um, this party will be over, right? Um, the earth will be fine, but we, we won't be here. And so that, I, I mean, that is, I mean, if that's not a wake up call, I don't know what is, right? Go back to watching the Kardashians. Yeah. And they're, they're still in society, there's so many more invitations to distraction and numbing than to doing the hard work of, of feeling and healing. I mean, distraction and numbing is the name of the game, ain't it? Whether it's Advil, Coors Light, a Prada purse, a Toyota truck, name it, right? It's there to scratch an itch, make you feel desirable, make you feel sexy, scratch all your kind of lower hierarchy needs and keep you on the hamster wheel of just being a consumer that doesn't really think for themselves. Right. And so, and, and, you know, there's plenty of money predicate, especially, you know, stay on, on, on point here with your, your um, podcast is, you know, they understand us men pretty well. We want to get laid. <laughs> we want to get paid. We want to feel safe. And, you know, there are teams of neuroscientists working um, all those angles to sell us things and get us to vote in certain ways and, you know, get us, route up over gun rights or route up over they're taking my guns. I mean, it's, it's all very easily leveraged because we're predictable monkeys. Where would you like to see humanity take a quantum leap to? Well, I mean, look, we are, we have some of the solutions in front of us. We understand that the green energy economy actually um, pencils better financially as well, just because the futures and, you know, you drill an oil well after, you know, three, five years, you're like, shit, we got to go deeper. We got to go sideways. We gotta, it's just, there's a, there's a lot of diminishing returns on those and huge capital investment. You put up a, a wind farm, the thing will just blow for a hundred years and just keep taking energy that is naturally, you know, getting extracted from the environment without any other inputs or very little inputs. So, you know, it's all there. I think that some of the dinosaur um, industry companies are just like organisms. They, they want to survive. 
So we're seeing a lot of the kind of regressive, you know, headbutting of, you know, dying industries, um, you know, kind of hold, holding out and trying to, you know, kind of feed their people, which is a natural instinct, right? Um, and I, th- I see a lot of that starting to shift. I see, you know, there's a huge, um, really, really interesting um, energy around um, sustainable ag, soil regeneration, um, carbon sequestration. Uh, we, we understand there's the science is getting pretty clear on what you know, what's happening, what we need to do about it. Now it's a question of political will and, you know, kind of navigating the enormous propaganda machines that have, um, you know, grown into these behemoths that are just leveraging people into believing, you know, campy shit. Hmm. Getting back to trauma is... Is the perceived magnitude of the traumatic event itself, is there a correlation from that to the effect on a person? Depends on the person. Mm-hmm. Two people can be in the same Rwandan genocide and one's all right and the other one's, you know, devastated because, you know, how they took it. Depends on how long your fuse is, how resilient you are, um, how you interpreted it, um, what your state of your nervous system was at the time that it happened how your mom used to react to things. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there's just so many variables that will really determine how one individual will respond versus another. It's very unique. Is resiliency something that can be learned or is it something that, you know, is it in your genes? Is it passed on? What where, where that, what it makes that learned. difference? It, it could be learned. I mean, these are all like learn, learnable skills. Oh. Right. I get up, I do my Qigong, I meditate, I take vitamins, you know, those are all resilience practices. I do tempering, I do saunas and ice and heat. Those are resilience practices, right? I I learn to let go of things as they come and not take them so seriously. I mean, there's, there, there are millions of practices that will help build resilience. The problem is we're all just lazy. And we think that there's no work that we need to do. Some therapist is going to like say something and just poof, make it all go away. That's just not how these things work, right? You got to work on yourself every day. Trauma or no trauma. So you say trauma or no trauma. Can, is it possible to be a human being and grow up without trauma these days? No. no. I mean, it's how a, a, a root will grow through the soil and come up to meet the sun, right? It's going to face calamity. It's going to face adversity to get up there. Now, look, I mean, I've, I had trauma. I was an immigrant kid. I had to fight my way out of certain things, but I wasn't raped by my dad either. Right? Like there are some significant big T traumas that I'm very thankful I didn't have. Um, But you know, there are also um, there's a, there's a great danger in diminishing the magnitude of your little T traumas because you weren't the person that was raped or gang raped or beaten or in some genocide. And so you're like, yeah, I'm fine. I didn't have, you know, Barry's story. Right. And then those people just, you know, they feel guilty to even admit that they have trauma and they don't heal it. Right. And that also is, you know, that's an epidemic of people who are just like, "Ah, I'm fine. Right. So yeah. Okay. You are fine, but let's talk about how you, you know, your shoulders rise up every time that guy walks in the room because he reminds you of a bully from junior high or whatever it is, right? So even if we're fine, we can always do better. We, we, our, our own personal experiences, our own happiness can evolve as well. Is oh, that what yeah. you're saying? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Every minute, every minute of every day. I mean, look, in the alchemical traditions, it's about turning lead to gold, the lead of human experience into the gold of pure conductivity and no impedance. So all the little things, all the little blips that, you know, make me feel insignificant, make me feel insecure, make me feel sad, make me feel ashamed. Those are inefficiencies in in my human operating system. Um, Not to say I need to like cut them and move forward, but to say that the only way I can move forward is to move inward. And to see them, heal them, feel them, acknowledge them, and grow, and realize what you know what lessons they carried for me. So, so in that sense, there really is an upside to trauma. Oh yeah, it's, I mean, it's a great teacher. Yeah. Trauma is a great teacher. I mean, when it's happening, it sucks, right? I don't know anyone who's like you know getting beat up in a back alley or something, saying, "Oh, this is such a great experience for me," right? But most of the people, and I've, you know, we interviewed so many 
people for the, for the series. I mean, they all, I, I, there wasn't a single one that said, listen, um, you know, on the other side of this in hindsight, it's the greatest thing that ever happened to me because it gave me strength. It gave me resilience. It gave me, you know, whatever it was. I mean, these are the people that are obviously, you know, that we're interviewing who are on the other side of it and have worked through it, you know, and then, you know, there's also a guy that just went through a bottle of gin, you know, yelling at his wife, you know, blaming her for, you know, all the problems in the world. (laughs) Right. And, and that guy, that guy needs that medicine, the real medicine. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I find again, from my own life and the evolution of my happiness, it was a big shift when I stopped blaming everybody and realized it wasn't my fault, but I could take responsibility to make changes, not just blame and expect others to do so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, it starts with you, it ends with you, but you know, if you're blaming other people for your, you know, calamities, chances are there's some underlying trauma that you're just not willing to look at. Yeah. And often it's often been said to me, you know, growing up and going through troubles and shit that, uh, you know, there's, there's a gift in your shit. But as you're saying, when, when you're in the middle of the shit, it's hard to go, oh, oh, look at all these great gifts I'll figure out someday. Like that's not the normal human experience of it. Yeah, it's just, it's not even a tenable position. It's like anyone who says they're enjoying the trauma when it's happening is either lying or, you know, got Stockholm syndrome or something, right? Like that's not, that's not how it works. But learning that this too shall pass and learning that, you know, this is coming at you for a reason and learning what to do about it and, and, and how to, Role with it makes you better and better at this kind of like, you know, interface of life. And look, I mean, I, I would have it no other way, right? Like my personality, my, my, my operating system is all really kind of predicated around a kid who had to fend for himself and find a way and outsmart, and, you know, all these things that then gave me edge as an adult and as, you know, a multimillionaire film producer and all the things that came from all that calamity. Right. I mean, thanks. <laughs> Didn't feel it at the time, but thanks. Right. Yeah. So if you, if you could kind of like imagine that, uh, that universal bank account being filled up as you're dealing with your horrible pain and shit and, and struggling with uh, resilience and, and hitting resistance of life. Maybe, you know, maybe that's a, a way to look yeah, at it. Well, and it's also the West has a very skewed relationship with it. The, the literal, so I'm a martial artist. I've been, you know, fighting my whole life and I'm, you know, I'm so good at it. I'm never afraid of the other guy. Now I'm just afraid of what I, what I would do. I don't like conflict because I know what to do there. Right. Hmm. And, the literal translation of Kung Fu is hard work. And so if I go to another martial artist and I'm just like, Hey, how's your Kung Fu? It's not like, Hey, how many guys did you beat up last week? It's how are you interfacing with life? Are you rolling with the punches and blocking and parrying and, and, and standing your ground or is life kicking you in the ass and knocking you in the chin? Right. And so learning to understand that life itself is Kung Fu and that you, it, it is training to make you stronger, better, faster, more resilient, and more bulletproof versus saying, oh my God, punches, right? It's like, yeah, I know how to block punches. I know how to block kicks and I know how to not anticipate whether it's a blocker, a, a punch or a kick because sometimes the guy's going to try to tackle you. And, and that's, that's how life works, right? And, and so learning to shift that interface of like, you know, blame and, and self-pity and all the bullshit that, you know, gets us, you know, in, in these weird cycles of sorrow and, and, you know, just ridiculousness here in the West, that's just not even part of the operating system in kind of the monastic training that I had. And it really took a while for me to kind of shift out of it because I grew up here, you know what I mean? I grew up, I grew up in this traumatized culture that has been addicted to anesthetics. You know, I I often say that silence kills men. And that's a big point of the conversations I have on on Real Men Feel is to kind of break down that silence. But, you know, going back to uh, the hunter gatherers and we're out on the hunt and yeah, men must be quiet and move with stealth. And we kept that, but we dropped coming back, having rituals, having initiations, having healings. We dropped that. And, And also in, you know, so many people are talking about martial arts and, but it become mixed martial arts. So maybe 
it's, it's all just physical. It's all ultimate fighting. And we've lost the well-roundedness of, of true traditional martial arts. Does that resonate? There's a philosophical core that is much more profound and relevant to the training of the whole human than, you know, some fucking arm lock that, you know, gets you, you know, rolling around with another sweaty guy trying to figure out who's the stronger gorilla, you know? And so I think it's, there's been a real de-evolution of the martial arts into the mixed martial arts. And not to say those guys can't fight, you know, those guys are superior in a lot of ways because they've taken the best. I mean, Bruce Lee was famously known for this, you know, he was doing fencing and dancing and, you know, like you, yeah, take the best of everything and become better at your craft. But we did lose the baby with the bathwater philosophically because the operating system is, is kind of skewed. Now that said, I'll still take an MMA guy and have a beer with them over some arrogant yogi who does, you know, spiritual stuff and doesn't acknowledge that they have any anger, you know, in the martial arts, man, you know, a guy who's just been, you know, on the mat working his ass off and bleeding and sweating and working out his stuff and, and, and um, projecting and controlling and understanding the flow of his anger is actually a less angry person than the pathetic guy who, you know, pretends he's never angry. Right. And that dude's scary. Right. And he's also better than you. Right. And, and, and so there, there's, there's a degree of humility that comes with, you know, just scrapping. Right. Yeah. Cool. I, I love that take on it. You know, cer certainly when, when I began to uh, growing up, my worldview was life sucks, then you die. So why am I fucking waiting? Um, and when anyone would talk about, oh, Andy, you got to learn to love yourself. You got to nurture yourself. You need to self compassion. I would just like, roll my eyes like what the fuck does that even mean i was just like bullshit so you know what what translation for self-nurturing might there be for for the guy that rolls his eyes at that whole idea yeah well i mean look i, I mean that guy is probably like any other guy that's listening to this like i just herniated a disc in my fucking neck and it's just like oh yeah that's there oh that's still there right and so for me that starts with just kind of like rolling my neck and distracting and getting in a position that like you know comforts it, right? If your hamstrings are tight, let's try stretching those. Um, you know, if you're, if you're fat, let's try, you know, exercise. Let's, let's just go for the immediate resolution of the thing that's in front of you. And that's called loving yourself, right? It's not this like airy fairy patchouli shit, right? Loving yourself is doing the thing that you need to take care of your body, your mind, your spirit, your soul. If you're tired, fucking sleep, right? If you're thirsty, drink water, right? And so just, just the self-care rituals that, um, you know, fall off, you know, what everyone now, you know, is, is caught up in all these like memes. It's like, you know, you got to change my name to Patanjali and, you know, dress differently and all this crap if I want to like do yoga, because apparently that's the only way I can love myself. That's all bullshit, right? Those are all just things that people are doing. And those are all identity politics that people get caught up in because it's hard enough being Brad. So now I have to be Patanjali and pretend Brad is, you know, no, no more. And that, that to me is the devil. That to me is, you know, moving in the wrong direction. Cool. So it sounds like a, you know, a, a simplest basic way to, to look at self-love, compassion for yourself, it, it, do what you like, like do what feels good to you. That's self-care. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah, shy I mean, of addictions and dangerous, you know, whatever. Sure, sure. There are circuits that you don't want to trigger <laughs> and, you know, go down that road um, because it's hard to come back, obviously. You know, coming back from addictive circuitry is it's work. Um, that, too, is a lesson, but, you know, it's one, one that I don't recommend for most. But, yeah, I mean, what do you need? Is your back hurting when you're sitting there? Sit up straight. Um, you know, if, if, if you can't run, figure out why stretch your hip flexors. Um, you know, if you, if you really, really like surfing and you don't get around to it, figure what, figure out a way to surf more often. Right. I mean, cause yes, you are going to die, but that doesn't mean kill yourself. It means enjoy the things that you enjoy until God takes you off this rock and you don't know when that's going to be. I noticed, I noticed also that that creativity shows up in a lot of ways for, for, for self-love, self-care. And sure. when, when I talk to client, when I talk to guys that are like in the trades and stuff, like I like point out, like, even if you're pouring concrete foundations, like th that's creativity, like you're sure. building, you're making a legacy. So th this creativity, is that a big part of things that you see that can help and bring healing to people? For some, I mean, I think a lot of guys are kind of shut out of creativity or they don't want 
you know, to admit that they're doing creative things because somehow that's gay. You know what I mean? Like there's all this like weird things around creativity, but I mean, I think everything you do is creative and you know, there's nothing wrong with being gay. Right. Like, and so it's like all these weird memes that are just fucking guys in the head. And, you know, for some, they go into creativity. Some go in, I, I mean, for me, it's, I, I have a brand new pair of skis right there. I've, I ski, I've skied 60 days this year. I love it. I created a scenario in my life where I get to ski all the time because that's what I love. And I work my ass off and I ski because I deserve it and I enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Right. And for me, that's my expression is that I'm not painting on a canvas, but I'm skiing through trees and loving life. So whatever that is for you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, that's what I've learned that, I mean, for me and a message I try to share with the, the point of life is to be, experience joy. Like it's meant to, the life is meant to be an enjoyable experience, life force, that energy that we are, it, you know, it's not misery and shame and guilt. Those are the blocks to it. That's what needs to get out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that doesn't get out of the way by you looking forward and just covering the rear view mirror. <laughs> the only way that gets out of the way is for you to go in, right. And acknowledge the entirety of your being and, you know, make amends with your past, you've probably done some things wrong. People have wronged you. Like it doesn't take that much work. It just feels icky. So no one wants to do it, but I've never seen a, another way out than in. Yeah. You got to go in. Yeah. Cool. So the evidence that you are busy and hardworking is, is really everywhere. You know, multiple books, TV series, films. I really admire all the creative efforts you have that, that are really serving humanity. Um, what inspired your, your latest is, 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 you know, this whole TV, what, what inspired the creation of that? What, what need is that out to fill? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so many things that are, I mean, just look at Netflix. It's designed to entertain and anesthetize the viewer and just give them what they want. Pass your time, watch this tonight. You're bored. You got nothing better to do, you know, binge watch this show. And, you know, it wasn't really serving the, the, the humans in a way that was actually going to help them with their lives. And so what we did is instead of going wide, we went really deep and, you know, just went into all the solutions, um, very specific solutions for problems that people have and myriad problems, obviously, because the, the, the network is, it's growing and it's big and it's doing cool things, but you know, there's brain health, there's gut health. There's all these areas where people are just messed up trauma. You know, we did the most comprehensive series ever done on trauma, right? Why? Because people who have trauma, most of them can't even afford a therapist, right? So how can I help the masses? Well, let me go, let me go interview the, the top experts in the world on this stuff and put it in a format that's affordable for the masses so I can help more people. Right. So it's, it's been a passion project. I love it. I mean, I'm, yeah, there's a lot of moving parts, um, but I kind of sit in the middle and just kind of like direct the, the, the soul of it. Right. And, and just make sure that, you know, it's, it's about helping people. Um, and, you know, and I'll candor, I don't do that much anymore because I have great team. Right. And that's the, the, the key to being, you know, successful in business is work with awesome people. And, you know, I, I would suggest that you can't be a total raving asshole and attract a great team either, though. 100%. 100%. Right. You can attract them for a, a month or two, and then they'll figure you out. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. I got good people. We take good care of them. And their mission is to help other people. Hmm. It's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a mission. It's, it's a spiritual mission. A lot of people, you know, come and go. But the people who are here to help, it's like, yeah, you know, it's, it's work and there's stuff to do. But, you know, when you're, when you're trying to help people, it feels good. Yeah, right. There's a level of, of fulfillment that comes. And when I was growing up, no one ever told me that service felt good. Right. I, I was like in my 40s before I like, wow, this really, wow. Instead of like focusing on how shitty I feel, if I help someone else, I feel a lot better. And so do they. And it's just such an easy uh, concept, but it we're, we're just not taught that. Yeah, it's, just, it's, it's the easiest of judo flips. But again, like, you know, we just grew up with traumatized parents who, you know, were doing the best they could. God bless them. But, you know, it's, you know, to answer your original question is how do we make a quantum leap in this generation? That quantum leap has to happen here in you as an individual, as me as an individual, so that, you know, I'm less of a dick to my son <laughs> and my daughter, right? And, 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 you know, start to fix it generationally going forward. So, Pedram, what's the best way that people can uh, find out everything that you're up to, follow you, track you down? <laughs> 
Yeah. Theurbanmonk.com or whole.tv, W-H-O-L-E.tv. So all my personal development book stuff is on the Urban Monk side. And then my um, film TV stuff is on whole TV. Beautiful. And my last question for you is, is there one thing top of mind that you wish more men knew? Relax. We're not allowed to relax, right? You got to look busy. You got to keep your legs moving. You're the breadwinner. You just, you know, you run yourself right into the grave, you know? And so we're just mules for society and we can't relax into being the tender, loving husbands and, you know, dads and whoever we need to be for the people in our lives, because we're all infected by this script that we got to be tough and we got to keep going. It's bullshit. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Pedram, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. Um, so much wisdom, so much lived experience, and I'm so glad that, that you're sharing so much of it, um, even while you have time to ski 60 days a year. So that, that's a fantastic <laughs> mix you have. You've, awesome. you found the middle. <laughs> I found it. I found it. You gotta, everyone's got to find it for themselves. Skiing yep. is my drug of choice, and <laughs> it's healthy. Until you hit a tree, it's healthy. Awesome. And uh, yep. thanks for, for listening to us today. Wherever you're listening to Real Men Feel, please subscribe, share this with someone, post a review, a comment. Uh, let us hear from you. And and now you can actually directly support the cause. There's a link at the bottom of the show notes, wherever you're listening, to give as little as 99 cents to help this podcast continue, to help us reach more people, to let them know that indeed real men do feel. Until next time, be good to yourself. <laughs>